Okay, welcome back, everybody. Ooh, maybe I lost a couple. Okay, no, no. Okay. Well, a um, couple of quick notes. Um, for uh, concern the assignments, okay, uh, as I stated earlier yesterday or Tuesday, uh, just a reminder, homeworks, you have two attempts on those. Now, the other assignments only have one attempt, but there's a lot of, some of the activities where you got to submit something, if for some reason, like, you get, like the first one, the welcome video, if you're having trouble uploading files, uh, and, and it does happen with cameras occasionally. It does happen. No big deal. Uh, you can still resubmit whatever you need to submit. Uh, try to submit it in the comments of the of the uh, activity. See if that works. And if it, Canvas doesn't allow you, uh, go ahead and submit it through Canvas email. Okay. And then as a last resort, if Canvas is really totally shot, then use my EDU email address to submit something that you need to submit, okay? Just FYI. But uh, yes, the activities only have one one attempt. Homeworks have uh, two attempts. Um, but again, I repeat, if you if you need to submit something and for some reason it maybe you didn't submit it properly or it's not allowing you, you can submit it through the comments or resubmit it through the activity. You're not gonna get penalized. And um, uh, or through Canvas email. Okay. Any questions? All right. Now I want to quickly just show you the two files that you really need to download and have to use. One is the uh, periodic table. Now this one's marked up. This is and and I'll you can do the same when the time comes and we talk about it. it's marked up, marked down with a bit of a lot of information. But this particular table. Uh, shows the periodic table. Now it has, there's 118 elements that have been uh, uh, discovered to date. The last three, I want to say 150, 116, and 118 were discovered uh, roughly about a couple of years ago. They now have official names. So these names that you see are, are like U, U, O, those are just temporary symbols for now, no, you don't, we're not gonna memorize all 118 elements, okay? We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna maybe deal with about 20, 20 or so elements, 20, 30 elements that we're gonna use uh, uh, throughout the uh, semester. And we'll get, we'll talk about that, but uh, tons of information. It looks like just a box, okay? But we're gonna learn that we can use the, periodic table and determine the position of a particular element, and we can do a compare and contrast and talk about, okay, which element is bigger? Not having to memorize this particular radius, but just know where it's at in the periodic table, okay? But more, more on that later. Other things on the periodic table, and if you look at the bottom left corner, these are what we call polyatomic ions. We're gonna use those quite extensively. Uh, down uh, to the right, there's something called activity series. That particular table we're going to utilize to predict the outcome of certain types of reactions. Okay, And then finally, down at the bottom right corner, the solubility rules. We're going to use these particular rules to determine whether a compound, a compound which consists of, of, of two or more different elements put together, uh, and we're going to determine whether it is soluble in water or not soluble in an aqueous system, I should say. Okay. So tons of information there that we're going to utilize quite a bit. The other bit of information, the other table is the um, the uh, shapes. Let me just make it smaller here. Can turn it here. A lot of information here. There are some constant uh, uh, factors that we're going to utilize, uh, conversion factors of temperature from Fahrenheit to Celsius, conversion factors from the metric unit to the English unit, okay, from inches to centimeters, pounds to grams, and quarts to millimeters. And then there is a table here that we're going to utilize when we start getting 
uh, in creating and making actual uh, compounds and determining their particular structure. What is their geometry? We're going to be using this particular table here, the shapes table, to help us determine what they are. But we're going to start first with the elements, okay? And I kind of I make it it's analogous to the language, the English language, any language that has the alphabet. You know, we start with the alphabet, the letters, okay? We we take the letters and then we start putting them together to make words, right? And then from the words, we start putting those together with other words to make, you know, short sentences. And eventually we can take that so short sentence and create paragraphs, right? Well, chemistry is very thin with respect to the elements. We're going to take the elements, talk about the elements singly, and then start putting them together to make compounds. And then these compounds that we put together are going to be reacting with other compounds to give us particular reactions to create other products, okay? So uh, we're going to start with, with the baby steps, start with the, with the alphabet, if you will, chemistry. But so much for that. So those are the two tables you really need to download because those are the ones you can have access, readily access when you take an exam. And if you try to take the digital file while you're taking an exam, your uh, uh, Canvas will pick up that you have ex exited the exam and we don't want that, okay? We want no exit factors being popped up. So you have that, that print out for you. Okay. Now, on Tuesday, we ended up with chapter 11, excuse me, page 11, slide 11, chapter one. And we were talking about the different states of matter, the solid, liquid, and gas phases of matter. And we talked briefly about the uh, how we depict those and demonstrate those with, with the aids of diagrams. You can see the solid is the spheres at which, we, which represent anything, uh, any, any element or a compound in the solid form, the various, uh, the particles are very close together, very structured, very order. We go to the liquid, you can see that they're, they're still combined together, but they're not loose, they move around with respect to each other much readily than the solid. And then the gas molecules or compounds are just totally solid, okay? So with respect to solids, solids have a fixed shape and a fixed volume, okay? We're all familiar with that. It's a solid. We have we can measure the volume directly, or we can measure it indirectly. We'll also talk about how to do that. But everything has a, a fixed shape. Any solid has a fixed shape and a fixed volume. The atoms in place will still vibrate. Atoms uh, will always move. Uh, even in the solid form, they may not move relative to each other very much because they're kind of locked in position. But within the molecule, there are vibrations occurring. Okay, so they don't they don't slow down. Uh, they tend to have a crystalline state, very structured. Or occasionally they, they have a non-crystalline state, but most of the time they're in the crystal shape. They're not compressible because if you look at the diagram, you can see that the spheres are, are just up against each other. You can't compress them any further. Also keep in mind is we saw we saw the images of, of the spheres that on the outside are the electrons. These electrons that orbit outside the atom are negative charged. So if you're next to another element with a negative charge, they will repel each other. So just we you know, in themselves are they're going to repel each other. Uh, just by being that close, and they're going to be a set distance from each other. You can't get them any closer. Okay. Uh, most solids have, tend to have what's called a higher density. Now, we introduced it uh, first uh, ratio. Okay. And, that, and there's the equation there to the right where density is defined as the ratio of mass over volume. Okay. Mass normally in grams. Volume normally in milliliters or liters. Next chapter, we're going to talk a lot about units and milliliters and liters and quarts and so forth. And that balance will have a lot more to say about that. So, but the thing is, I, I want you to put in your long term memory when we're dealing with ratios that we can write the ratios either in this case, mass over volume, 
or we can simply invert it and write it as volume over mass. And we can do doing that allows us to set up these ratios so we can multiply it with another factor that will eventually cancel the units out and we can get an answer. Okay. It looks a little bit like I don't know what you're talking about now, Fred. It'll hopefully come clear when we get to it. Um, ice is uh, an exception because we know that ice will float when in water. Ice cubes do float, okay? And you might ask yourself, when well, we'll talk about this, is why is it that ice, ice floats? Well, and, and think of it in terms of that ratio. So here's some food for thought. That ratio of mass over volume. Now, if we take one gram of water, one gram of water, and we and and we measure its volume, okay, guess what? It would have approximately one milliliter. Its volume would be one milliliter. So one over one gives me a density of one gram per uh, milliliter. Okay. Now, if I take that same gram of water and stick it in the freezer and freeze that water, guess what happens to the volume? The volume of that one gram no longer is one milliliter. It actually increases. It gets bigger. That's one of the properties that's very unique to water. So instead of one milliliter, now it could be like 1.1. So now that ratio of one gram over volume now becomes one over 1.1. And if you divide that number, guess what? That number becomes 0.9, which is less than one. We use water as our reference point for density, and it has a density of one gram per milliliter. Okay. Anything greater than one tends to sink in water, and anything less than one tends to float in water. So ice, just by virtue of it expanding, changes that ratio and it changes its density, becomes less than one. Okay. And now it has a density of about. 0.9, which means it will float in water. Okay? Very unique to that, to that, to water. Now, solids generally do not mix with each other very well because they're locked in position. Okay. And they really don't undergo much what we call diffusion, you know, which kind of move from point A to point B through variety processes, which we won't talk about, but diffusion has most of what we know said about that. Now, with respect to liquids, uh, liquids take the shapes of the container. We, we know that, right? If you take a gallon of milk and it has its particular shape, if I take that same gallon and now I dump that same gallon of milk and I dump it into a larger container, well, now it has a new shape, right? But it still has the same volume of one gallon, yeah, regardless of what container I put it in. So the volume is constant with respect to liquids, but their shape will vary it's in the container. Uh, different liquids flow at different rates, and, and that is due to these, what are called IMF, intermolecular forces. These are forces of molecules interacting with each other, okay, which are related to the electrons around these molecules. These interactions sometimes are very strong, Sometimes they're very weak. And we're going to learn quite a bit about that down the road. I mean, it allows us to predict and compare and contrast and explain why one compound flows readily, like water, compared to another compound that flows not as readily, like honey. Liquids, as the case with the solids, are not very compressive. Okay. Because again, the molecules, even though the molecules and atoms are, are free flowing moving around, they're still very close to each other. So there's not a lot of gap in there that we can push, push them together and, and make them more compressible, which is a good thing because without these liquids that are not compressible, you would have had things like power steering, you know, power brakes. If you ever drove, dr driven a vehicle with no power steering, well, it could be quite a challenge or, or brakes be quite a challenge, okay? Thank God for hydraulics and the, the fact that liquids are not compressible. Uh, with respect to density, they tend to have higher densities than gases, okay? Gases. And 
If the liquid, and here's the thing to know, if the liquids are soluble in each other, they will mix uniformly. If they're not soluble in each other, they will not mix. mix okay. Uh, classic example would be um, a, a drink, you know, like an alcoholic drink. You got alcohol and water, two liquids, okay, two different types of liquids, but they mix. And you can make yourself a drink, right? But if you get oil and water, guess what? They don't mix. And now you, you have maybe things, something like Italian dressing. You know, take Italian dressing, let it sit here. Don't you have two layers? You have two layers, one's an oil layer, one's an egg. So it'll you know, mix uniformly. Okay, gases. Gases have no shape. And they take the shape of their container and like the liquids, okay? And because the, the molecules are so separated, they will expand and they can compress. Okay. In fact, as the volume increases, the volume the atoms get further apart. And as the volumes decrease, the atoms get closer together. So the gases at this point do not have a set volume. Now, when I say at this point, because down the road, under specific conditions, we're going to learn how gases have a specific volume. But right now, as it stands, gases do not have any, any, any set volume. Uh, very low densities at ratio of mass over volume, okay? Very small. If you look at air, you know, you got a, a, a density of point, uh, roughly 0 0.001 grams per million. Okay. And like liquids, they will mix completely with other mixtures. The air out here is, is it's a mixture of multiple different types of gases. Okay. And by the way, you like my beach back here? I get back when I'm done here, I'm headed back. Yeah. All right. So, you know, for example, air 78% uh, nitrogen, about 20 some percent oxygen, carbon dioxide, and all kinds of other different types of gases. So it's it is, they, they mix, gases do mix. Now, our gases, they exert pressure, okay? Don't believe me, take the tire pressure. Check your tire pressure. You should be at 32 PSI, right? Uh, because those gas molecules that are inside your tire and they're bouncing up against the walls, exerting a pressure on the walls of the inner, inner tire. Put a pressure gauge in there and you've got a measurement, okay? As the mass goes away from your tire as the air goes out what happens to the pressure boom goes down you have a flat tire right what do you do you go a quick trip get on get the air pump it in your tire add more mass more gas molecules into your tire pressure goes up right don't want to add too much you want to bust that tire all right so we have here a uh, table, and the question is, with respect to solids, solids, to summarize everything, yes, have a fixed shape, okay? And yes, they have a fixed volume, okay? Uh, with respect to liquids, they do not do not have a fixed shape. They take the shape of the container, whatever shape that is, but yes, they do have a fixed volume. As I stated earlier, one gallon of milk has a particular shape in its gallon container. And I take that same gallon, I dump it into a 55 gallon drum. Now it's got a different shape, but I still have one gallon. Gases do not have a fixed shape, okay, as the case of liquids, and do not have a fixed volume at this time. Down the road, there will be a fixed volume. It's way down the road with respect to the chapters. Now, type of physical, uh, well, physical and chemical properties, okay? Physical properties describe the appearance of the chemicals and some facts about chemical, such things as the color, the color of the chemical, you know, whether something, you know, has an odor to it, maybe it smells good. A lot of winter green like mints have a very nice flavor, right? Nice odor. Uh, a lot of those are chemicals, by the way. Those chemicals like winter green are made from an alcohol and made uh, from an uh, organic acid. Separately, those guys don't smell very well, but if you put them together, 
I create what's called master, and you got all these nice smelling uh, um, senses like banana oils as a master, uh, all kinds of all kinds of compounds. So, and there's a test for a combination of acid and alcohol to give you some pretty good strong stuff. Paste, which I don't recommend pacing chemicals, as you know, you know, if you're working in a lab, but of course, food is a chemical, you think about it, you know, that's okay, because you, you're familiar with your, your uh, the, they're all chemicals. You might think of them as a but they really get broken down. They're, they're all chemicals. Texture. Melting point, at what temperature does that chemical matter? It's very specific for the chemical itself. Uh, and also how pure, we use melting point to determine how pure something by its melting point. Its physical state, whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas, is density is the physical property, whether it's soluble in the aqueous system or in an oil system, whether it conducts electricity. And if it's a solid, how hard it is, that's a physical property. You know, there's some solids that are very brittle and some solids like steel that are very hard. Okay, diamonds, for example, are extremely hard. Okay. With respect to chemical properties, is you know, how do they react? How do they behave under certain conditions? Are they explosive? Classic example, TNT, dynamite, they're very explosive, okay? Uh, things, are they corrosive? Is it corrosive in nature? Or are they poisonous? These are types of chemical properties, okay? Or it could be a chemical that's basically inert. Pure 100% gold is inert. It's a chemical property of, of pure gold. It's, um, it's uh, uh, totally inert and very unreal. Maybe yes, it can react, but it requires very vigorous conditions. More on that. Uh, rust, does it rust? A lot of metals rust over exposure, and that's a chemical property of it, okay? And it oxidizes and or decom decomposes. All right, so the physical changes, these things you're fully aware of, you maybe not know the name of them, but when something that is a solid and goes to a liquid, we call that melting, okay? Ice is melting when it goes to the liquid, right? Now we could have a liquid go to the gas. You know, what do we call that? That's called boiling, or it could be vaporizing or evaporating. Take a pot of water, you heat it up, make some spaghetti. You're trying to get rid, getting ready to make some spaghetti. You're taking that water, you're boiling it. You're converting the liquid into gas. Okay? And taking the gas and making it liquid, so now, now you have a gas and you're going to bring it back to the liquid state. We call that condensation. Okay. Classic example is you've got a glass container with ice, and then on the outside, especially in humid, humid day, doesn't it not get wet? Right? Well, I always have to ask the question here where is that water on the outside of the container? Where does it come from? Okay, I got a I got ice cold soda pop or diet coke. Okay, I got a little bit of moisture outside. Where is that moisture coming from? Anybody have an idea? Take an ice cold drink out of your refrigerator, put it on the on, on the table there, and, and if it's a humid day, you can see it start condensing on the outside. Where is that moisture coming from? Is it coming from inside the container, making its way outside the container? No? Anybody have any suggestions? The moisture in the air, exactly. Okay, actually you're hitting it right on the head there. All around us, Right now, some days more so than others, which is unusual for Arizona because it used to be much drier <laughs> back 100 years ago uh, when I was a kid than it is now, but there's a lot of, mo a lot of moisture in the air. That, those gas molecules are full of energy and they're out here in the vapor phase, right? Now, when you 
when they start hitting the outside of this container, which is cold, those molecules that are full of energy and have a lot, have a lot of energy and heat, now that heat is lost to the outside of the container, so the energy that molecule has in the vapor phase is lost. And now the molecules start coming together and attracting to each other much greater than they were in the gas phase, and they go back into the liquid phase. Okay. And if they continue to lose energy, guess what? They freeze up. It's a man, it's a function of energy when we move from solid liquid to gas or gas liquid to solid. It's a matter of adding energy into the system to cause the molecules to separate to eventually go into the gas phase. And it's a function of taking that energy away for them to re come, come together and condense to go back into a different phase. Okay. So nothing magical, no Harry Potter stuff going on here. Okay. Okay, liquid to solid is freezing, right? Take some liquid, stick it in the freezer, and guess what? In an hour or so, you got a new state of matter, a solid. Now, this is a little bit different. Here, it's going directly from a solid to a gas. Now, it could pass, bypass the liquid, but if it does, it's just it's doing it so quickly that it doesn't exist as a liquid. Okay, and that is called sublimation. Okay, you're you're probably familiar with this. If you go to Fry's and you go buy some dry ice, okay. Anybody know what dry ice is made up of? Anybody want to take a guess what dry ice is? Not water, I know you're gonna think ice, dry ice, you know. Not water, anybody have an idea? Carbon dioxide, Chad, you got it, Erica, you got it. You are correct, okay? Car dry ice is nothing more than carbon dioxide that has been taken from the gas phase and converted into the solid phase, okay? And then what happens is, is you take a little bit of dry ice and you let it sit there. It will evaporate very quickly and bypass the liquid phase and go directly into the gas phase. Okay. And, uh, you know, FYI, side note, if you get some dry ice, put some around. If you've got a lot of plants at home, put them around the plants. Okay. And they're good for the plants. Any idea why? The carbon dioxide. Plants need carbon dioxide. Don't put them on the plants because if dry ice is cold, you might hurt the plant. You could buy some dry ice or guess what? You can talk to your plants. Now, why would you want to talk to the plants? Other for psychological reasons. Why would you want to talk to your plants? Anybody know? Yeah, I talk to them all the time. I Okay, I got four of them here. Exactly. Okay, because we exhale carbon dioxide. And talking to them will, they really enjoy it because they need carbon dioxide. And guess what? They give you back oxygen. It's their, their waste, so to speak, their waste gas, oxygen. Okay, so now, so solid to gas is sublimation. Gas to solid, we call that deposition. Okay, so we take carbon dioxide and convert it back into solid black carbon dioxide. It's called deposition. Okay. So um, what we do to demonstrate uh, in a formula and they, how to do that, I don't want to say that chemically, but how we show that is by these, a chemical process. We write out a chemical process and that is shown here. In this example, let me try and second here. Okay. Now we write a chemical process here. Okay. We have an arrow. Okay. What this tells us is to the left of the arrow, we have the reactants. 
uh, my ink, my pen has been misbehaving. And to the right of the arrow are the products. Okay. And that's any chemical, a chemical physical process. We got an arrow, the left is what the reactants are, something happens to them, and then we end up with products. Okay. Now, in this scenario, you can see we have the formula H2O, which is water. So if we look at the reactants, we had the formula H2O. If we look at the products, guess what? The product remains structurally, formula-wise, the same. H2O. So nothing was done chemically because if H2O was converted chemically, we've had different products. For example, I can take water and have it undergo electrolysis and I can generate hydrogen gas, which is H2, and oxygen, which is O2. Okay. Right. That is a chemical process where I totally change the structure of my reactant to something else as a product. In this scenario, even though you may not know what's going on with your spec, okay, what does that two mean? It's a subscript and tell you know, it's telling you there's two hydrogen atoms and then we've got an oxygen atom. And they're all bonded and we're going to learn how they're all bonded together. Okay. But you can see that. H2 in the beginning remains H2O as a product. The only thing that's changed is we write in parentheses its physical state. In this case, L represents a liquid. Okay. And G in the product side represents a gas. So H2O as a liquid went to H2O as a gas. So that is a physical process. You know, and how do what do we do to make a liquid go to a gas? Guess what? We put energy into the system. Okay. All right. We call that body. So all of this diagram, this diagram kind of shows everything we talked about of going from a solid to a liquid, liquid to a gas. Okay. And it's all about energy. And going from left to right, we are putting energy, I'm going to call E for energy, into the system. And if we continue to add energy, we take, well, we begin with the solid, put energy into the system, becomes a liquid. We continue to give energy into the system, becomes a gas. The opposite is we take away energy, negative energy, we remove it by maybe cooling things down. By removing energy, we take that gas and now we make it back. We send it back into the liquid because we have removed the energy these molecules have. And now they are come closer together and they start to attract to each other by these IMF, intramolecular forces. They start to attract to each other. Think of it as like magnet, magnets, if you will. I got two magnets here in my hand and they're out here separated they're in the gas phase, right? Moving around, right? They're, so they're not coming close to each other. They might, might hit each other once in a while, but then I take the energy away from the system and they start coming together, slowing down, if you will, because they're very rapid. They've got a lot of energy in the gas phase. And as I remove cool things down, I remove the energy and it starts slowing down. And pretty soon they get close enough like magnets and they kind of attract to each other. Not quite like man magnets, but I'm trying to use an analogy. Okay, and they come back together. Now, now they become more in the liquid phase. And if I continue to remove the energy from the system, they go back into the solid phase. Okay, so all of this diagram kind of demonstrates everything. It's a function of energy. And these are for chemical processes. That's the one part. We're not doing physical processes. We're not doing anything chemical. Okay. All we're doing is changing their physical state. Okay, movement physical changes. Atoms are always moving, even in solid state. Okay, when you heat the ice, water particles can uh, gain energy. 
we have a specific name for it. It's called kinetic energy, which is, which is really, kinetic energy is related to movement, okay? Because as we put energy into a solid, we start, those molecules start to move, okay? And they start eventually going to pull away from each other. So they gain kinetic energy and they start to move faster, okay? And if they gain enough energy, they overcome these attractive forces they have for each other, and they go into the gap, into the next phase. Okay? And if we continue to give energy to the system, they'll continue into the next stage. Going in this example, maybe going into the gas phase. Okay? It's all about energy. So, okay, a chemical process here. Composition of the reactant that's to the left of the arrow completely changes to what we have now in the product side to the right of the arrow. Okay. And we call these chemical reactions. Now, the starting substance, the starting material is the reactants are totally destroyed, destroyed, and something new with totally different properties is made. For example, burning gasoline. Okay. Now, here's a very generic formula. It's C subscript X, H subscript X. What this is a generic formula for what we call hydro, goodness, carbons. I don't know what's going on with my pen. I, I dropped it the other day and I think I did something to my pen. So, in, and this is also an introduction to you. One, a, one of the six chemical reactions that we're going to eventually talk about. This is called a combustion reaction. A combustion reaction consists of reacting a, high, reacting a hydrocarbon, okay? which is a compound made up of nothing but carbon and hydrogen. X can vary in, in number. The smallest, the smallest hydrocarbon is one carbon and four hydrogens, okay? Which is that formula, which is methane. And then, oh my God. Methane. And then, Sorry, that's an E, methane. But X could be any large number of any large number, and so is hydrogen. So when we take a hydrocarbon, when we combust anything, of course, what do we need? We need oxygen, right? So oxygen is always 100% of the time a reactant. Now, for Chem 130, the only two products for the combustion of a hydrocarbon, I'm going to repeat that. The only two products for the combustion of a hydrocarbon is carbon dioxide in water. Okay. Yes, I realize you have a vehicle that you could uh, burn you, you know, coming out of the exhaust is carbon monoxide. And that's true. We're going to assume 100% efficiency as far as burning your vehicle. But our vehicles are not 100% efficient. In fact, in, in order to get it, a, a combustible engine to be 100% or close to efficient, we need to operate extremely high temperatures and most materials can, can handle the stress. All right, so uh, for CAN-130 in the combustion of a hydrocarbon designated as the general formula CXHX in the presence of oxygen, you gotta have oxygen for it to burn. The only two products are carbon dioxide and water, okay? All right, so first type of reaction called combustion reaction. Holy chemical change here because that hydrocarbon and that oxygen have both been changed chemically. Totally new products have been made. It's still carbon, don't, don't get that wrong. It's still carbon, but now it began as carbon as a hydrocarbon and it be, 
converted now as carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. Now, some of the indicators of a chemical reaction. Okay, you know, how do we know by observation if something happened? Uh, well, uh, oxidation of the matter, for example, something burns. That's a good indication that we have we have a chemical change. Very rarely, unless you're the phoenix bird, you come back from from the ashes to come back and go back into deep back in full state. Okay, rust, for example, is a is a, is a, a chemical reaction. And we just have a pickup with a lot of chemical reaction, a lot of rust on it. All right. Uh, Release of gas bubbles fizzing without heat. You know, I'm not a uh, uh, good example of this will be Alka Seltzer. Okay, you take the tablet, dunk it in water, and then you get this buzz, the fuzz, the fizzing going on. Okay, and uh, that's that's a good indication in the reaction proceeds. Now, speaking of Alka Seltzer, uh, does anybody know, just off the top of your head, your best guess here, no right or wrong answer at this point, but I don't want you to put your thinking caps on. What, what, is, what is that bubbling of, of the Alka-Seltzer? What is, what's causing that bubbling? And as soon as you drop that tablet in that water, it starts to fizzle and you get all this bubbling action going on. And um, I can tell you this. Let me give you this hint. alka seltzer and water is very good for your plants. If you take a little glass of water, throw some alka seltzer taps, put it by the water, your plant will be very happy. Why? Carbon dioxide. Exactly. Now, you might ask, well, where did the carbon dioxide come from? Well, if you read the label of the alka seltzer, you'll find has a little bit of citric acid and a little bit of maybe a bisodium bicarb, baking soda. And in the solid, they're not going to react with each other very well. But the moment you put them in water, the binder dissolves and all the chemicals are released. Now the citric acid finds a carbonate. They react, form carbon dioxide. It's an acid-base reaction. And you get bubbling. Okay. And a lot of people think, to my knowledge, I don't know what medicinal value carbon dioxide is or why they put bubbling in there, but uh, it will carbonate your water. That's about it. So, and you just better off just drinking the active ingredient directly. And it, anyway, so uh, sometimes another indicator of a reaction proceeding is you get a solid form. You might get two, react two reactants that are maybe clear, colorless, liquid form. You mix them together and poof, you get a solid. That's a good indication that a reaction occurred, a precipitation. And that also represents another type of reaction we're going to be learning about. Okay, uh, Release of heat is a good indicator. If you go to uh, CVS, pharmacy and get yourself a hot pack or a cold pack. What do you do? You get that pack, smack it, let it, let it wait for a little bit, and it either, depending on which one you buy, either gets warm because maybe you hurt a muscle and you're going to put it in your muscle or it gets cold. You know, put that also in your muscle and it gets cold. Those are chemical reactions that are occurring that give off heat or take in the energy from the system and, and, and get cold. Or the glow tubes, the glow, you know, those glow things that you crack, the two reactants occur, a reaction occurs, and one of the products is emission of light. Okay. That's a good indicator. Obviously, a color change. Again, you got two uh, chemicals that have no color, or maybe they're blue in color and they, after the react, become yellow, but there's a color change. That's a good indicator. Or there's an odor. Some chemical reactions, like I said, the alcohol and the acids that you put together to form an ester, to form things like a, like winter green or banana oil. You know, by themselves, the chemicals don't smell real good, but when you mix them, the, the chemical that you create is very nice odor. And that's a good indication that a reaction proceeds. Or 
the other end of the spectrum, your former compound that smells pretty bad. I've had a lot of those. Okay, so here's a here's a a um an example of a chemical reaction. If we take sodium, and now here's an introduction to the the symbol of sodium, which is Na. We're going to learn more about these symbols here in a bit. Okay, that is sodium. Now in this pure state. It's a very reactive metal. It's a soft metal. It's got a metallic shine. Here's a picture of it there. It's very reactive. In fact, it's so reactive that we need to store it under mineral oil. If we react, put it in water, oh my God, it, you're literally going to explode. Okay. So we can have a very hazardous, very reactive metal. Glass indicates we. We're going to have the, uh, a reactant, two reactants. So we have the reaction between sodium and guess what? This is called Cl. This is called chlorine. Chlorine is a gas, okay? And yellow in color. And more importantly, it's a poisonous gas. A poisonous gas. A lot of municipalities, these uh, are companies uh, that treat the water, use chlorine gas, or even a swimming pool use chlorine to treat the pool and if you ever if you live by one and you see a cloud of yellowish smoke out there by all means go up wind because that that is chlorine gas very 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 hazardous so we have a very reactive metal very poisonous gas you put them together voila you make a product that you can put on your french fries sodium chloride this is the formula for sodium chloride NaCl Okay, it's table salt, AKA table salt. Uh, not too dangerous, not as hazardous as chlorine gas, not as hazardous as the sodium metal. It is hazardous from a, from a physical state, meaning if you got the high blood pressure, you don't want to deal with too much sodium, right? And here's the kicker from all this, and we learned about this. For this reaction to proceed, what happens is, remember I talked about these tiny electrons? Two electrons, two, I'm going to, they're denoted by the letter E with a negative one. Two electrons were transferred. Two of them came from the two sodiums and were given to the chlorine. Okay. And the chlorine picked them up. And those two tiny electrons made this whole new product, this transfer, and made this whole new product of sodium chloride, which is not, it's still sodium. Okay. Still sodium, but in a different form, sodium salt. And those two tiny electrons have a vast, vast effect on chemical processes. Okay, so here's an example of a, of a chemical reaction. So here, what you are given are, are these reactions. We got these chemical processes or physical processes. Okay, and they're asking you, is it a chemical or a physical change? Well, you might look at number one and you say, well, I have no idea. I don't even know what NH3 is. Okay, that's fine. Okay. However, you can observe and you can deduce, right? Because I stated that if you look at the formula as a reactant and then go look at the formula as a product, if there's a change in the formula, guess what? You have a chemical change. And in this case, we have NH3, and I'll tell you what that is. I think we're all familiar with this. NH3, something uh, happened to NH3, but chemically, it can't, any, nothing chemically happened. Why? Because I still got NH3 as the product. Okay, so structure didn't change. So I go back and I look at the state. I went from a gas to a liquid. So I must have a physical change here. Put P for right now. Physical change. Okay. NH3. Well, if you got little kids at home and you have diapers that have been sitting there for a while and you get a little bit of an odor of ammonia, and that's what it is. Or if you use ammonia cleanser, that's what you, that's the formula for ammonia. NH3, a nitrogen with three hydrogens bonded around it. Okay. Number two, let's break it down again, all right? We got NH3 again, so good old ammonia's reacting here. 
Okay, it undergoes a process given by the arrow. But then I look at the product side and guess what? I see a plus, okay? That would indicate to me that guess what? I must have a chemical process, right? Because now I got two products, okay? And so now I got just nitrogen all by itself. And we're gonna learn about this too here. We got nitrogen all by itself. And then we got hydrogen all by itself, okay? That plus so tells me that I have a chemical process that occurred because I have taken the NH3 and I broke it down to its elements of nitrogen and hydrogen. So therefore, I have, I must have a chemical process there. Okay. All right, number three. On the surface, you might think, oh, H2O, right? That's a good, be a good initial guess. However, there's a subscript too. Okay, so it's not H2O. Okay, I'll tell you what it is in a second. Yeah, and this, this also is something you, you may be familiar with. All right, but then I look at, I look at the arrow, process occurred, but then here's my plus again. Ah, flag comes up, I got a plus sign, that means I got two different products, definitely a chemical process because I got a hydrogen and oxygen. So I broke up that H2O2 into its components, into its elements. So I have a chemical process. This, by the way, is if you ever cut yourself and you want to uh, put it on your finger, it's a disinfectant. You may have used this as it's hydrogen peroxide. They're recommending now not to use this on cuts. I guess because of the destruction it can have for on good cells. But now they're recommending this water. All right, so this hydrogen peroxide is also the same material utilized to similar material to utilize to whiten your teeth. There's a lot of peroxide in there. Uh, color your hair is peroxide in there. All right, so let's look at number four. We got H2O2 again, hydrogen peroxide again. Okay, we look at, go to the right of the arrow. We continue to have H2O2, so that right there tells you I got a physical change, okay? I didn't break up the hydrogen and the oxygen into this component. It's still intact. So I go, I can see my states. Now I went from a liquid to a solid, so that verifies that, in fact, I have a physical change. Okay. The next one here. Again, you may not know what that is, but you got C6H6. But remember earlier when I said the combustion, remember I had CXHX, those are hydrocarbons. Here's an example of a hydrocarbon where X is six in both for the carbon and the hydrogen. Okay, so that's a hydrocarbon. All right, so that's all you can see. I, you can just deduce at this point that I got a, hydro, a hydrocarbon. And I look over to the arrow and guess what? I got the same formula again, C6H6. So therefore, I can just very quickly say it. I got a physical process and then verify by the physical state that it goes from a liquid to a gas, okay? Physical state. This, by the way, is something called, called benzene, which um, is a hydrocarbon, but it's a nasty hydrocarbon. It's been known to cause liver cancer kind of problem. All right. I mean, physical, chemical, chemical, physical, and physical. Now, we went through how we broke it down. You're going to find a chemistry in, in, these, in this class that I like to take the problem and break it down stepwise, okay? Eventually, where you, you break down stepwise and go at it systematically, you're going to get to the point, hopefully, that, you know, I don't need to go through all this stuff. You can go directly from here to here. But in the beginning, I always take a step, step-by-step uh, uh, step attack on the problem, okay? And we did that here. We looked at it. We don't know what the chemicals are, but we do can observe and see that the formula remains the same before and after. That indicates physical. If the formula changes after in the product side, 
we got a we got a chemical chain. Okay. All right. Which brings us to element compound image. Well, elements. Okay. Elements are simply just an atom singly. Uh, they could be single atoms like helium. Okay. Or they could be what we call diatomic. Notice that the earlier examples we had O2, H2. Okay. Now, when we get more into the elements, you will find that there are only seven elements that are what we call diatomic. Okay. Meaning that by themselves, they cannot survive, at least here in this environment. By themselves, they're not very stable. It's a function of energy, okay? In this environment, those oxygen atoms by themselves are not very stable. So what they do is they combine with another atom of oxygen. It's still an element. It just happens to be now called a diatomic. Di meaning two, atomic meaning atoms, okay? And there's only seven. That means all the other 111 are monotonic. They they will survive with single single elements. So they can be broken down any further chemically. Okay, they are what they are. Uh, carbon is carbon. If I break carbon down any further, break it down, and now I'm breaking it down into its subatomic particles, the proton and neutrons, and, and now that just pieces of the element, okay? So that's the element. Now, with respect to a compound, a compound is just simply is a combination of two or, two or more different elements. So when we had carbon dioxide, for example, CO2. I have two elements, I have carbon and oxygen, two different elements. This is a compound, H2O, made up of two or more different elements. It is a compound, whereas O2 is an element because they're still the same element. They're just two of This happens to be a diatomic element. And then, of course, we've got uh, something that's pure, pretty self-explanatory, you know, nothing else, nothing else other than a pure material. And it's pretty self-explanatory. And, of course, we can have mixtures. We can have mixtures of, of compounds and elements and diatomic compounds. We can have diatomic elements and monatomic elements and compounds, all kinds of compounds. We can have a mixture, all kinds of combinations there up to make a mixture. Okay. And we can actually go and separate those two. We can look through a, a chemical process to separate that mixture. All right, so in this diagram here, we have matter. And if we have a mixture, you can see here is denoted uh, some examples of mixtures. The different colors represent different types of compounds slash elements. So we have, looks like we got uh, um, two spheres that are red in color, okay? That definitely will be an example of a diatomic element. And then we got the two dark spheres that are, you know, all by themselves and it's still not. So here we got a mixture of two different elements, okay? Over here on the right side, same scenario. Maybe we got, we got two elements over here. On this side, we just looks like we got three different elements, okay? Now, with respect to compounds, this can represent, you know, sodium chloride, where we got the two different color spheres combined. Okay, that is represents a a uh, a compound. Now, water here it looks like Mickey Mouse ears, right? Well, oxygen is a central atom, and we will talk about who is the central atom when we put these together. And if in, in the case of oxygen. I mean, hydrogen, H2O, we have oxygen in the center, and then we have the hydrogen bonded to the oxygen. So you get this, this effect here. Notice they're pure because nothing else in there. 
other than water molecules, the same is true for the sodium chloride example. Okay. With respect to elements, there are no compounds, obviously, here. And the compounds can be either diatomic or it could be monotonic. Monotonic. All right. Um, let's clear this up here. So some examples of mixtures, okay? We have metal alloys, things like 18 karat gold. Gold, your, your jewelry, for example, your gold jewelry is not pure gold, right? Pure gold in itself is a very soft metal. It doesn't lend itself well to be made into jewelry because it doesn't have the strength. Uh, you make a ring out of pure gold, you know, first time you smash your hand is to smash the metal. So what is done is other metals are put in there to make a mixture or an alloy. And obviously you can vary the mixtures to give you different properties. Uh, brass is a mixture of copper and zinc, okay? And stainless steel is not iron, pure iron. Pure iron by itself would not lend itself well to be made, to be used to make uh, into buildings because it's not very structurally sound. So we add things like carbon to give it more, more uh, uh, stronger properties, okay? So other examples, tap water, obviously, the water that comes out of your tap is a mixture of all kinds of stuff in there, depending where, where you uh, live. There, sometimes it's pretty clean, sometimes it's not, okay? Things like uh, what are pure, obviously we made sodium chloride, cleaned it up, you get pure sodium chloride, chloride, salt. And diamond, if you have um, a diamond, it's pure, not all diamonds are 100% clean, there's always minute impurities in there. But pure, if you had one, pure 100% diamond with nothing else, Diamonds are made up of nothing but carbon, okay? Which you think about this, okay? Think about this. The carbon atom itself in the diamond is no different than the carbon atom in your body or the carbon atom in carbon dioxide, okay? It is still carbon. And yet, diamonds are the hardest thing on Earth. And you're made up of nothing but carbon. There's other things like graphite, which are made up of carbon too, but graphite is a, is a lubricant, dry lubricant, made up of carbon atoms in there. And that is very, very soft. And, and like I said, it's a dry lubricant. And yeah, here you here you have it. You got the carbon in your body, the carbon in, that makes up the cell structure and the carbon in diamonds. Well, why is there a difference? Why is that the diamond so strong? And it's all a matter of how the atoms are put together relative to each other, okay? The structure between them and how they interact with each other that lends the, to the property of the material, okay? For example, polystyrene. We're familiar with polystyrene, right? You've got cups of polystyrene, very soft. If you have any uh, acetone at home or fingernail polish remover, uh, take a little bit of that. Take some polystyrene and dump it in. It dissolves right away. Okay, uh, very soft. You can crush it. Polystyrene. Okay, but I can also take that same polystyrene and depending and, and control the conditions, the reaction conditions a little bit, and I can make polystyrene that is strong enough to be used to make buildings from. Okay, and it's still made up of nothing but carbon and hydrogen. So structure is a very, very important part in how the properties of compounds interact with each other and affect, then they themselves affect the properties of the overall structure and how they can be used to make different things. All right, here's some examples of um, the diagrams. Now, if you submit this, I think one of the activities is to submit uh, a, an example of an element and compound mixture, please. Um, uh, let me put it this way. I, uh, on Tuesday, I stated when you write your notes, my advisor mentioned that write them in the manner that, you know, five years from now, you can look back and know what you wrote. 
Okay, you can realize I understand what I wrote. I know what I was doing. The same with the things that you submit. If you submit something, look at it this way. Can I fire someone? Look at it and know what I what I drew or what I put together. Okay, because I have been getting uh, examples of the elements and compounds and mixtures, and they're not they're not marked. They're not telling me who's what. I just got a bunch of circles and I'm trying to figure out what's what. So do 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 mark it up at least direct me to who, where I, what this is, what that is, so forth, okay? All right, so you can see the element in the far left. That's an example of an element, specifically a diatomic element they're put together there, okay? The one in the middle, it's a good example of a compound. The compound is made up of two more different elements combined. And then here in the far right, we got a mixture, obviously, and it looks like a mixture of at least two elements, two different elements and a compound, okay? All right, so if we look at A, we can say that A is a good example of an element, specifically diatomic. B would represent a compound. Uh, C would represent a mixture, specifically a mixture of at least of two different elements, okay? D, since we all have nothing but the dark sears there, it's just an element. Compound for E, obviously F is a mixture, good representation of the mixture. And, and if we need to know more specifically, that would represent a, a mixture of a diatomic element in two different compounds, okay? Uh, G also is another mixture of an element and a compound. And then H again would be an element and I can even extend there and say, you know, that's a good example of a solid because the spheres are all rigid and stuck together. Everything else could be a liquid or, or and or gas, you know. All right. If I needed to deduce more information from the diagrams. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna jump into the elements themselves. Okay. Now. Each element has a unique name, a unique symbol, and a unique number. Okay? Now, with respect to the symbol, uh, a lot of them have just a single letter. That letter is always capitalized. Okay, And so hydrogen, its symbol it would be H. Carbon would have its symbol as uh, C. But some elements have two letters, okay? Whereas this is important, the first letter is always capitalized, but the second letter is lowercase. And that's important because if you look at cobalt, which is a symbol CO, like that, by looking at that, I, I know you're talking about cobalt. But if you make that O a capital now, this represents carbon. Monoxide. I'm sorry. Hmm. I'm gonna have to troubleshoot my pen here, but that's carbon monoxide. Okay. So when you write these symbols for these elements, it's very specific. Okay, and the thing about science in general, we, we, we are very specific about things, okay? We can't assume anything. <laughs> so if you mean carbon cobalt, then you write uppercase C, lowercase O. If you mean carbon monoxide, then C and O are both uppercase. If you are thinking cobalt and you write it like carbon monoxide, it's incorrect, okay? All right. Now, most symbols, you know, have English names. So H for hydrogen, O for oxygen, HE for helium. Okay. But uh, Latin plays a factor here. For example, PB is a symbol for lead. Okay. 
and it comes from the Latin term meaning uh, plumbum, which means uh, waterworks. And then gold has the symbol for uh, AU, which comes from orium, which means golden dawn. Uh, AU and AG get uh, mistaken a lot. AG is silver, AU is gold. Okay? So be familiar with the first 20 elements, okay? First 20 elements, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go through them real quick here. Yeah. Okay, so the first 20 goes to calcium, okay? So H is hydrogen, and we shoot across to helium, H-E. We shoot back to Ali, number three. Notice the number on top. Of the symbol, you got the you got the symbol, okay, and then you got a number on top, which is the atomic number for that element. Each one has a unique number, and then underneath the symbol, you have an atomic weight, okay, and much more on that down the road. Okay, so we have lithium, which is Le, number three, uh, Be, which is beryllium number four, okay, then we shoot across to number five, which is boron, B, carbon is number six, nitrogen is number seven, number eight is oxygen, number nine is fluorine, not to be mistaken with fluoride, which is what you find in your toothpaste, the IDE, Totally different than the INE, the fluorine. This is fluorine. The element is the ene. Then we got NE, which is neon. Okay. Number 11 is natrium, otherwise known as sodium. MG is magnesium, number 12. And then we shoot to number 13, which is AL, good old L, aluminum. And then we have SI number 14, which is uh, silicon. P number 15 is phosphorus. Number 16 is S for sulfur. Number 17 is Cl for chlorine. Number 18 is AR for argon. Okay, which then we flip around to number, number uh, four. No, not number four, number 19, which is K, which is the symbol for potassium, okay? And then number 20, CA for calcium, okay? Then on, on top of that, we have other ones, and we're gonna have a few more besides these, but AG represents silver, AU is gold, we mentioned that, PB is lead, BR is bromine, I is iodine, and HG is mercury, okay? As the case with uh, bromine, you know, there's bromide, I-D-E, and there's iodide, I-D-E. So that's not the element. The element is the I-N-E-N-D. -E. Okay. Now, the physical states of the 118 elements. And you might think, well, we got to know them all. Yeah, but you don't have to memorize them. You just have to know a few things and the rest is fairly automatic, okay? All right. When we talk about the physical states, we're talking about specifically, we have to define what temperature we're at. And we are at 25 degrees Celsius, basically about room temperature and at one atmosphere pressure, because physical states are dependent on the temperature. Obviously, the physical state on the sun is a lot different than the physical state on, let's say, the Pluto, okay, where it's very cold and very hot, totally different physical states and different here on Earth. So we have to have a reference point. So at 25 degrees and at one atmosphere pressure. There's of the 118 elements, only two of them are liquids, specifically mercury, which is a metal, and Br2, which is a diatomic element, which is bromine. 
Okay. All right. Now, uh, we have uh, approximately seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve elements that are gases, specifically H2, which is hydrogen, N2, which is nitrogen, O2, which is oxygen, F2, which is fluorine, and Cl2, which is chlorine. And then you might ask, well, who are the noble gases? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me go to the product table. This last group here, right here, this group here on the far right are what are called the noble gases. Notice they have a Roman numeral on top of eight, V, I, 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 eight. They have on the outermost shell, okay, remember we talked, we talked earlier about electrons being on the outermost shell. They all have eight electrons, that magical eight number, a lot more than that magical number on the outside. And that's why we call them normal gases. The only exception is He, helium. It has two electrons. But the point being, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven noble gases plus hydrogen, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, plus the ones I just mentioned. Of the 118, 12 of them are gases, okay? Which means that all of the rest of them are solids at 25 degrees. So you know where the noble gases are, the last color on your right, you incorporate, include hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine, okay, which is a total of 12, okay? Those are just gases, and then the two liquids, and then everything else, everything else are solids, okay? So, and, and this needs to be known when we start running chemical reactions because we need to know the physical state. And by uh, knowing which one, what is, what is what, you can write the physical state. So here is periodic table, and this will be the last one I'm going to show you, and then we're going to call it quits here. Notice the, the everyone in yellow are the gases, okay? Noble gases in the far right. And then the two, I guess, pink ones, which is mercury and bromine, which is right here. Those two are liquids, which means everybody else in blue are liquids, or solids, excuse me, okay? All right. So let us stop it here. And where we at? We are, I'm gonna to have to kick it up a little bit, but let's stop it here and then we'll knock this out on Tuesday, jump in number two. Uh, we should be done with two on Tuesday and then knock out three the following Thursday. Uh, next week, and then the following Tuesday, you'll have your first first exam. Okay, so um, do go jump ahead. By all means, you have videos to go and get ahead on this on this chapter. So don't 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 wait on me. Okay, uh, so do jump ahead. Do uh, start keep up with the homework. Or keep up with the worksheets in there. Um, if you have any questions, shoot on email. I I'm trying my best to get get your answers to you quickly. Just bear in mind that I have two of your classes at GCC and one at uh, SEC. And again, if you want to come to my Friday class, feel free. Okay? I have no, no problem with that. Okay, well, you guys have a good weekend. Um, stay out of trouble. <laughs> we'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>